Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising as we convene our second of five programs on whistleblowers. And today we're going to be concentrating on people who have been whistleblowers around the buildup of a competition and military uh, conflict with China. I want to welcome uh, Jody Evans, uh, uh, the co-moderator of this program, who is right now in China, in Shanghai. Uh, so Jody, uh, welcome to Humanity Rising. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us again on this week where we're gonna talk about disinformation and the disarming of the discourse. And um, the disarming the discourse was actually created by Lawson, who you're gonna hear from today. But it so well says what happens that power and the warmongers, they weaponize your hearts and minds to be used for war and against the, your needs. And what we're doing is learning about that this week. So um, I just wanna jump right into it because we have two very special guests and um, uh, you know they, they don't have a lot of time, so uh, we'll jump right in. The, the first is um, Kale um, Holmes. He's an international relations analyst, a writer, an environmentalist who has been living um, in Beijing um, for a few years and has just come back to the United States and now is Code Pink's China's Not Our Enemy campaign coordinator. And you got a big lesson on China's Not Our Enemy um, a few months ago. And then the other is Lawson Adams. He's a 24-year-old college student in Los Angeles. And um, two of his four years in the Navy were spent working at the NSA in Oahu, Hawaii, as a Chinese language analyst. So you're gonna get to go up close and personal with, with this whole idea of disarming the discourse. So I turn you over to these two amazing young men. Uh, welcome, Kale and Lawson. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Jody and Jim, and to all of Humanity Rising um, and its audience. It's an honor. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. I think uh, the stuff that we're going to talk about today is really important. So yeah, I'm excited to uh, to be here and honored to share with you guys. And we, we wanted to just get started by, you know, focusing on this idea of what is disarming the discourse. And, you know, as Jody was saying, they try to weaponize our hearts and our minds to embrace a pro-war agenda, which does not reflect the interests of um, most people around the world, of anyone. And it's really dangerous that it's happening, especially in the context of China, because, you know, the United States and China are two nuclear armed states, and we are in um, just a, a landscape full of pro-war bias, and it's important for us to call that out. So we wanted to essentially go over why, um, why we kind of started this project. Uh, you know, I just wanted to look at a few clips, um, just kind of gather, make a collage of news clips for like your average China news story that you get in Western media. And you see that there's, you know, increasingly almost a uniformly negative uh, portrayal of China, right? Where Whether it's Fox News trying to claim that war is inevitable or posit that war is inevitable over Taiwan, whether it's Olympic athletes who have Chinese heritage just, you know, competing for the country of their heritage, that being reported in the context of Cold War rhetoric. You have the Wall Street Journal having an opinion piece calling China the real sick man of Asia by Walter Russell Mead. And, you know, this, this climate, you know, echoes a lot of what we saw during the 19th and 20th century with the yellow peril kind of hysteria, which never really died. And 
is part of, I think, an overall trend of Orientalism, which uh, really animates and afflicts U.S. foreign policy from uh, really from uh, the, our own hemisphere to to Asia. So, uh, Lawson, why don't you kind of share kind of like your background? Because you know, um, as someone who used to work for the NSA um, as a translator, I feel you have a really great insight into how this disinformation originates in our culture right <clears throat> yeah so um while i was in the navy um i was taught chinese um for about a year and a half and then i went to oahu hawaii where i worked at the nsa as a chinese uh, translator and analyst um for the nsa um and yeah i i have a good idea of um, the environment and the culture that exists um, within the NSA, at least, and um, I suspect uh, intelligence agencies at large, uh, and especially as they relate to China. Um, and so I wanted to start today by kind of just referencing our classification regime. And it's based on three main designations, and that is uh, top secret, secret, and confidential. And these three main designations are, in theory, um, supposed to indicate the amount of damage that will um, result to national security if the information that they designate is leaked. Um, so top secret is supposed to result in exceptionally grave damage, secret and serious damage, and confidential and damage. Um, now, these three de designations might seem vague to people. And if they do, that's exactly correct. They are vague. Um, there isn't, you know, any objective way to determine how much damage might result to national security if certain information is leaked. And so different classification authorities can be inconsistent with each other's determinations um, regarding that. Um, but this is also assuming that information is always classified with the intention of protecting national security. And it isn't. Um, in many cases, information is classified in order to hide embarrassing or even illegal conduct from being discovered. Um, and apart from this, um, information is also classified um, by people who, uh, you know, there's a, there, there are a lot of young people in the NSA who, you know, they don't have much training. They go through a little bit, but they're still kind of unclear on how to classify certain information. And so information that isn't even, it's not, uh, but a large portion of it is overclassified simply due to employees erring on the side of secrecy uh, to protect themselves because they're unsure of what designation to use. And, you know, you don't want to leak something that might be dangerous. So you just err on the side of secrecy to save yourself. And so all of this kind of results in three different ways that information gets classified. And that is uh, information that is genuinely uh, secret that needs to be classified like, you know, uh, nuclear codes. Uh, obviously, we all probably agree that those things need to be classified. Um, but then there are two other, the two other ways is that information is classified to prevent embarrassment and uh, to basically, you know, hide people's incompetence. Um, let's see, the, the PowerPoint went down, but um, information basically this entire environment um, prevents people, the public from being aware of information that is vital to uh, various issues and it has an impact on public opinion. And I think worst of all, it creates an environment um, where there's virtually no accountability for people who withhold what should be public information uh, because we simply don't know what's being withheld. Um, and then, so the next part is the, it's, I call it the, uh, secrecy heuristic or the power of secrecy. Um, there was a study that was titled the secrecy heuristic, um, where, let's see, actually, yeah, sorry. Uh, where basically, um, it found that, uh, 
information or people value information that is classified more than just regular information. Even if it's the study, you know, had uh, the same information, but for one group it was classified, for the other it was just regular information. And for the group that uh, thought that it was classified, they tended to uh, see it as more valuable, more important. And furthermore, um, they decided that the decisions that people um, made based on information um, that was classified was, you know, uh, I guess more that it was that they were just better decisions. You know, inform or decisions that are based on classified information are better than those that are based on um, just public knowledge. And obviously, that isn't the case. Um, in many instances, uh, intelligence isn't correct. Um, and so, in uh, the in intelligence agencies like the NSA, the CIA, um, they can use what are called strategic leaks. Um, and we see strategic leaks in the media all the time. And these are just meant to influence the perceptions and opinions of Congress and the public. Um, because a monopoly over the flow of certain information is extremely useful. It's just like the monopoly of violence um, that states wield. Um, intelligence agencies can use secrecy like a brush and the media like a canvas to paint any picture they want using misleading information. Um, and so an example that I like to use is, you know, say a office in the NSA or the CIA wants to procure more funding for their office. There's a simple way to do that. And all they have to do is just leak information into the media. The media doesn't, they're not, you know, critical of it. Um, they run with it. And the information is meant to paint the picture that here's, here's this problem that my office can solve. Um, you know, we don't have adequate funding uh, or we're not devoting any funding to this problem. And here it is. And then the public, you know, goes crazy over it. Congress goes crazy over it. And the office ultimately gets more funding. And Lawson, also, uh, to, to interject, you, I remember you showed me a clip by um, a whistleblower. Uh, do, do you want to cue that up, actually? So I yeah, think there's actually, so the um, that link below um, that, uh, box that isn't working should take you to it. Well, I, I yeah, I think I, I queued it up here as well. And I think this kind of gets to what you're talking about. Yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, so you could probably skip to about a minute. But you said a minute in? Yeah. Yeah. Either he goes with the information or he doesn't, and ordinarily or usually, the journalist would go with it because it was it looked like some kind of exclusive. And um, I would say our percentage of planning that kind of data was uh, 70 to 80 percent. The correspondents we targeted were those who had terrific influence, the most uh, respected journalists in Saigon, like Robert Chaplin of the New Yorker magazine, Kai's Beach uh, of the Los Angeles Times from time to time, and also he worked for the Chicago Daily News, um, Bud Merrick of U.S. News and World Report, uh, Malcolm Brown of the New York Times, and even Maynard Parker of Newsweek magazine. Uh, we would uh, go after these gentlemen. Uh, I would uh, be directed to cultivate them, to spend time with them at uh, the Caravelle Hotel or the Continental Hotel, to socialize with them, and, and slowly but surely to try to gain their confidence by dolloping out uh, valid information, information which was true. And then I would drop in a, into a conversation the data that we wanted to get across, which might not be true. Uh, one piece of data, for instance, uh, that uh, we managed to plan in the New Yorker magazine had to do with uh, a supposed North Vietnamese effort in 1973 to develop airfields along the border of South Vietnam. The reason we wanted to plant this information was that uh, we were trying to persuade the U.S. Congress that Saigon should uh, be continued to uh, should continue to get a great deal of aid. Uh, yep. 
Yeah, so that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about with strategic leaks. He, you know, in very explicit detail lays out exactly how it's done. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, it's a pretty dangerous uh, tool that intelligence agencies wield. Exactly, and I feel it also shows like a very a really close working relationship between the military industrial complex and like the mass media. Um, the other strategy that I uh, wanted to talk about that the United States military and intelligence agency intelligence agencies use is, uh, you know, basically throwing a stone and hiding their hand. Um, the United States is notorious uh, for, for provoking its official enemies and then you know, portraying ensuing responses as acts of aggression. And I think that we can all probably think of a few instances in recent history um, where this has happened. Um, so there, this was taken from a uh, South China Morning Post article. In 2021, a uh, large U.S. reconnaissance aircraft conducted around 1,200 close-in spying flights over the South China Sea, uh, and this is the South China Sea alone, um, while noting that U.S. warplanes traverse the East China Sea as well as the Yellow Sea. Um, the Chinese military deploys fighter jets to intercept and deter aircraft approaching its airspace. However, intercepting jets occasionally approach reconnaissance aircraft uh, rather closely, which U.S. Uh, military and intelligence agencies uh, characterize as aggressive and unprofessional intercepts. Um, so... When this happens, um, nobody really asks the question of, you know, why why were our reconnaissance planes there? You know, why are we flying all along China's coast every single day? Would we be okay if uh, China was flying their reconnaissance flights, you know, along the California coast every day? How would re how would we react? You know, it would, you know, we would probably react in a very similar way uh, to how China reacts to us. Um, in an AP News article that I linked to, um, focus lies solely with the conduct of the Chinese pilot without any regard to the larger question of why we're flying along China's coast. Um, in 2001, um, there's what's called the Hainan Island incident that occurred between a uh, US Navy EP-3 and a Chinese J-8, which resulted in the death of a Chinese pilot and the detainment of 24 EP-3 crew members, um, as well as a tense standoff between China and the United States that lasted for 10 days. Um, and I bring this up because this is a perfect example of the dangers of the United States flying reconnaissance aircraft every single day, multiple times a day, all along China's coast, um, which you know we did it in 2001, and it resulted in this really tense uh, diplomatic crisis between you know, two superpowers, and we continue to do it. Um, it, when it hasn't stopped powers. either, right? It, it, like it's, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't stopped, and it's gotten much more frequent. Um, so the chances of such an accident occurring uh, are a lot more likely. So yeah. for it to occur in this current environment would be really dangerous. Can we play this? Uh, I want to play this clip from CNN, actually, that talks about just how, like, commonplace this kind of provocation has become. Mm -hmm. I actually can't hear it. I think it's muted. Oh, wait. The Chinese fighter escort, part of a regular routine. I'd say it's another Friday afternoon, South China Sea. Yeah, and so the main thing that I drew from that clip was that Navy pilots comment that, you know, to him, this is just another another Friday afternoon in the South China Sea. But would it be another Friday afternoon, you know, on the California coast, if Chinese pilots were flying multiple reconnaissance aircraft every single day, you know, on, on any given day, let alone every single day, it would be a huge deal. Um, and you can probably imagine 
the kind of crazy calls that would be in the media, maybe to shoot the plane down. Uh, you know, we certainly did that with, with an air balloon, but, uh, yeah. And then I have two pictures, um, one basic, Oh, can you go back? I'm sorry. Um, there are two pictures. Um, and one is basically a hypothetical, um, that shows North Korean, Iranian, Chinese, Russian bases, you know, all speckled all along the Atlantic, uh, uh, Mexico and the Pacific coasts of uh, the United States, um, and just kind of how how crazy that se that seems to an American looking at a picture like this. We couldn't imagine all of these countries surrounding the United States, but below it is a picture of military bases that are actually uh, speckled all along uh, the Pacific near China, and. Um, you know, it's not crazy uh, to see how from China's point of view, this is a serious threat to them. Um, but we we don't ever consider it that way. We think that it's our right to plant military bases all over the world. Um, the United States, you know, it's never been surrounded by hostile military bases and that's not an accident, you know, and to ignore how the US would react um, to China if it were in a similar situation is misleading because it leaves the impression that China's misbehavior this, uh, that China's behavior, I'm sorry, is somehow distinct from that of the United States. And it flies in the face of our 200 year history under the, under the Monroe Doctrine. Um, in 1962, for example, uh, in response to the USSR providing Cuba with nuclear armed missiles, the Joint Chiefs of Staff unanimously argued to airstrike the island and John F. Kennedy instituted a naval blockade. Um, and even the appearance of a competing great powers uh, military presence in the Western hemisphere uh, was enough to warrant a US bombing campaign uh, as was the case with Grenada in 1983. Um, the Reagan administration feared the USSR would use uh, an airport as a military base and connect with Cuba um, and its presence of 600 military students living in Grenada uh, during social unrest was a pretense for invasion under the War Powers Act. Um, and I, I bring this up specifically because um, the pretense for invading Granada was 600 uh, medical students. And as we know, there are tons of U.S. nationals that live in Taiwan. So if any um, if anything were to occur between China and Taiwan, there is a very serious chance that whoever's president at that time could use the War Powers Act and use the pretense of U.S. nationals in Taiwan to unilaterally um, conduct an act of war against China. So it's it's a really dangerous thing that we have to look out for. And uh, if something like that happens, we have to call on the, whoever's president at that time uh, to refrain from doing that because doing so would spark um, a war that you can't return from. Absolutely. Uh, everything you said, Lawson, is very prescient too. And, um, I know you have to hop, um, hop off, but I think it's really important, especially, you know, we have what right now with the United States just going guns blazing um, on Gaza um, and the West Bank. Is it kind of is it is it is this Israel's um, atrocities uh, against Palestine and we see American hostages um, uh, being like a big part of the mythology that underlies a lot of the way the media reports on what's happening right now in Gaza. And uh, with China, you know, the, the unfortunate thing about this is propaganda works. I mean, if you look at this graph, you've seen, uh, we, we compiled the graph when we uh, made a presentation, Lawson Adams and I, and we, we you can see that after you know, the, the United States has, after the U.S. media has begun to target China, um, you know, statistics show that it had an effect on public opinion. Right now, we have really a Cold War, and the, the, the underlying reasons for the Cold War that we have right now, none of it gets ever reported, ever. I mean, essentially, since I lived in China, um, from 2019 to 2023, uh, 2022 rather, I had the chance to learn a lot from different scholars and different people in the international relations world um, of 
many nationalities actually. And what, one of the things I learned was basically the difference between perceptions of tensions over Taiwan um, within the United States and how those tensions are perceived, not only um, in China, but the entire world or in a lot of other countries. Because, I mean, no one really understands the history of the one China policy, what it is, what does it mean to have a normal relationship with China? Uh, essentially, like it was a condition when after the Chinese Revolution happened and the People's Republic of China, which had control over the Chinese mainland, um, established ties with other countries. A condition for establishing ties was recognizing that both land masses across the Taiwan Strait where, um, and specifically in Taiwan, including Taiwan, where the nationalists fled to after the Civil War, both of those land masses, the mainland and Taiwan, were part of one China. And this is the basis on which the USSR, Indonesia, Pakistan, countless countries, Algeria, made peace with China after 1949. Except, of course, the United States does not recognize the People's Republic of China, it recognizes Taiwan as the, the seat of all of China. Both both land masses across the strait, by the way, even the United States rejected um, the idea of two Chinas. It was floated for a time by like career diplomats and even like different media organizations. But both Taiwan and China always rejected one, sorry, two Chinas. Uh, then Reagan issued a bunch of assurances to, at that point, the Jiang dictatorship in Taiwan where he was like, the U.S. is going to not play any mediation role, you know, now that we have normalized ties. We're just going to keep um, sending weapons to Taiwan, but, you know, we also don't uh, commit to any kind of mediation role. So in a lot of ways, blocking chances for a peaceful resolution to, like, uh, what's technically an unended um, civil, civil conflict. Uh, it was, I think it was in 1995 when President Li Tung Kui, or, you know, in Taiwan, their, um, their leader visited Cornell University and Beijing opposed this. And in response, you know, the U.S. sent warships to the Taiwan Strait. It was a big standoff. And we've seen more and more armaments since then to Taiwan under the Clinton administration, under the Bush administration. In 2006, George Bush Jr. doesn't even disclose to the UN what kind of specific weapons it's sending Taiwan. Um, you also have the bombing of an embassy in Belgrade in 2000, sorry, 1999, um, which was clearly marked and it was, you know, chalked up to be like an intelligence error. It was an intelligence mistake, is what Bill Clinton told um, Jiang Zemin of China. When it was clearly marked actually before the US bombed uh, the embassy, that was an embassy. It was one of the few places that pilots were told not to bomb in Belgrade during the NATO war in Yugoslavia. And this kind of encirclement of China continues. Um, Chomsky had a book called Failed States where he like went into this history, right, of the US media hyping up, you know, China's. Mil um, modernization of its military, when at the same time we're expanding in Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, Australia, upgrading the Philippines to a non-NATO ally. Um, and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton just openly claiming that like we want open access to Asia's maritime commons, but of course we're neutral, right? Kind of playing the field. Um, you had a point where ultimately like we have this pivot to Asia and it becomes clear it's all about militarism, sending 2,500 Marines to Australia, sending warships to the Philippines. Um, and the dispute of the China, the China Philippines maritime border disputes really flamed up in the 70s under Ferdinand Marcos Sr. And now we've seen kind of an inflammation of them now that the US mutual defense treaty with the Philippines is kind of being invoked. Lloyd Austin says we have an ironclad commitment to the mutual defense um, treaty. But the thing is, the Filipino um, uh, network of U.S. bases 
and a lot of Filipino faces themselves now, which the U.S. has full access to, that has been a sore point for who can kind of like navigate these islands, uh, sorry, navigate th these waterways, which are very sensitive, um, considering that like this was, these military bases were born out of U.S. colonialism in the Philippines. And a lot of Filipino peace activists and environmentalists have been protesting, saying they don't want to be the first casualties in a war between two superpowers. Um, and like, we've known that tensions have been really getting worse and worse since Trump. But even before that, we were sending $14 billion worth of weapons to Taiwan. Uh, we kind of were testing the grounds for the trade war in 2012 when we started putting tariffs on Chinese solar panels. And of course, the freedom navigation exercises in the South China Sea, which I like to call freedom of provocation exercises, uh, which is how they essentially function, because they're also protested by a lot of other countries, not just China. Now you have um, the situation since Trump has been president where we have the full-blown tariff war. We have sanctioned Hong Kong, um, like the mayor of Hong Kong, uh, the former mayor, mayor Carrie Lam, was couldn't even open a bank account in certain contexts. We have... Um, the former White House advisor, Steve Bannon, just threatened war with China in 10 years. That was in 2017. Now, 10 years from then was, was going to be 2027, right? And I was in Congress recently, and they were talking so openly about baiting China into a war around the year 2027, what the chances of U.S. success would be um, over um, in a war of China over Taiwan. And this is kind of talked about without any kind of understanding of the history, what it means to have a normal relationship with China, how it would devastate the entire region, really. Um, and now it's open for our leaders without question to just say engagement with China has failed. Um, like former U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said that when he was still in office. Um and Biden has actually taken the torch from Trump in way um, more, in almost unprecedented ways, like the AUKUS military pact, for example, where now Britain and Australia are kind of patrolling the Pacific with nuclear-powered attack submarines, which can be easily weaponized into actually, you know, actual nuclear submarines, which is very dangerous. Um, and... China has become more weary of taking the U.S. seriously and trusting the U.S. You know, after we had um, former Speaker Nancy Pelosi go to Taiwan, you know, China pulled out of climate talks um, with with U.S. diplomats because, um, like, these provocations have a real effect, um, especially if we're intending to actually provoke China. <laughs> Clearly, if you try to provoke someone, it's natural that they're not going to take well to that. And the crisis of China coverage kind of legitimizes this. We'll talk, I want to talk about Taiwan a little bit later, but, you know, I also just want to focus on how this year has been very dangerous from, you know, now Biden has even armed Taiwan under the foreign military financing program, which is only reserved for sovereign states. And again, this goes back to a violation of the one China policy, which Beijing has been opposing for so long, but it's not really seen that way in the U.S. media. And, you know, the spy balloon, which Lawson brought up, I think is a really fascinating time because it just goes into how, I mean, you see like the BBC and CNN back on April 3rd, they essentially reported this with inconsistencies, you know, both of them said different things about whether the balloon could actually capture pictures. Um, and it's so pervasive that I even get tripped up myself. Like I just revert to it as the spy balloon, right? Um, the Chinese, of course, said it was not a spy balloon. Uh, meteorologists who I worked with in news um, said, uh, American meteorologists, that is, said it was not a spy balloon. It was likely a meteorolog meteorological balloon that was blown off course. Um, and even after it was debunked, you know, Reuters even kind of called in to question the validity of the claim made by like those two BBC and CNN articles. 
Biden can even say if it was transmitting data in real time. Um, even after it got debunked, right, on June 29th, uh, Pat Ryder said, yeah, we, it was not transmitting data in the first place. There was no data to transmit. It's like, what do they think spy means? And the U.S. claimed the balloon had signals, signal had um, intelligence capabilities based off of the fact that it had lots of antenna. But that's consistent with lots of balloons, which are made for climate research. Um, the damage was done, though. I mean, the U.S. went on a global disinformation campaign, as reported by the New York Times, when they said American briefings were designed to show that the balloons were equipped for intelligence. And we were essentially targeting other places like Japan, Taiwan, India, and the Philippines, trying to scare officials from there. Um, and the damage resulted in Blinken postponing an already tenuous trip with China. He eventually went, but right before he kind of uh, um, expanded the U.S. military's reach in Papua New Guinea, which was um, student protesters at the time opposed his visit. Um, and the media went even further than Blinken. You know, right before he went to China, he made a speech at um, a university in D.C. And he was saying China is like our long term challenge. And news sources like Politico and USA Today went even further, kind of par characterizing his statements as calling China a threat. And this is the kind of culture that we are existing in at the moment where, um, you know, China has become such a boogeyman where all you have to do is tell a scared country live going through a pandemic, show them pictures of wet markets, release op-eds about China being the sick man of Asia. And people, uh, unfortunately, um, since China is not really accurately portrayed, um, can easily fall prey to this propaganda. Um, you know, this is how war start. I mean, Politico uh, even had to fact check the Trump administration, but I mean, it doesn't really matter because the entire media, like you have the Wall Street Journal um, coming out. Uh, it was, I think, Michael Gordon, who was, by the way, a, a rock war propagandist. You know, he wrote some of the articles with Judith Miller that, um talked about claims of biological agents being dispersed through drones you know Saddam Hussein conducting campaigns like that scaring the American public um to enter into a war with Iraq to invade a country and kill up to a, um, a million a million or more people and now he's kind of cherry picking um intelligence leaks um uh, intelligence information um, sometimes just circumstantial evidence, uh, you know, partially relying on conservative think tank fellows. <laughs> and this has an effect and the media ends up going along when Biden takes the torch from Trump on trying to punish um, China for somehow uh, being responsible for COVID-19. And it, it, the effects are clear, right? I mean, it's been debunked over and over again. Wuhan Institute of Virology's Shirjun Lee even shared information with Georgetown University researchers. Those researchers were thankful. I mean, Nature Magazine, the WHO, so many people have debunked this over and over again, the lab leak theory. But, you know, we're at, the, at a place where anti-Asian hate during COVID increased over 300%. I mean, three in four Chinese Americans feel uh, has say they've suffered racial discrimination in the past year. Uh, I mean, you have CNN kind of normalizing this xenophobia, kind of uh, back during the 2020 primaries, they asked him how he would punish China if elected president, right? Um, and of course, in the media, rarely do you actually understand that China um, didn't just like let this pandemic happen in unleashed around the world there's really little follow-up that's done um like i've seen very few places reporting on how the supreme people's court actually uh reprimanded the wuhan police for silencing um dr lee Wenliang, for example um 
And, you know, you have also, I think, a trend of techno-orientalism on the rise. Uh, you have companies like Google and Microsoft alleging that China is either trying to steal our AI innovation or uh, interfere in our elections with deep fake technology. No evidence has ever shared with the voting public, but Business Insider, uh, Washington Times always take these stories at their word, take the Silicon Valley companies at their word, right? And Microsoft has relationship with the military industrial complex. It's important to know, as does Google. Um, and uh, you have the a lot of threats against TikTok um, kind of in that same fold where you don't even have data ex security experts, just spy sheets and politicians being quoted. Um, and, you know, we have the situation where like defense official Kathleen Hicks is talking about launching an AI drone warfare fleet to target China. Like a very kind of dangerous place that this drives us to. Um, and I wanted to circle back to Taiwan, actually, just because I feel it's important to talk about how the media omits even Taiwan public opinion. Does it even, you know, cover pro-unification voices or critics of Taiwan independence? People who are critical of removing Chinese history from their textbooks. Um, and it's important to remember, by the way, that like uh, officially to have relations with China, it's important to realize that there is one China. Um, that's a precondition for a normal relationship, which the U.S. has hinted about leaving. Um, and, you know, there's this New York Times article I read just like last month where uh, they were talking about Nancy Pelosi's visit um, last year being in show of support for the island. And it's like even the Brookings Institute, you know, admitted earlier this year that most people in Taiwan saw her visit as a um something that was detrimental to their own security but i mean we can talk about taiwan we can talk about i think the the u.s uh kind of militarization of asia of the asia pacific under the u.s indo-pacific command through the lens of understanding what the united states is doing you know the um People's Republic of China is expected to surpass the U.S. as the world's largest economy by 2030. And you also have the Chinese military is not necessarily easy to um, threaten as, as it was. For example, we don't live in the time where you can bomb the embassy in Belgrade and you can just kind of solve that with diplomacy easily anymore. Um, you know, there's no... Um, we're in a place where China can be more assertive and afford to rightfully question um, U.S. provocations. Um, and when it comes to control over waterways, trade routes in the South China Sea, control over AI innovations, we have to question the link between the military industrial complex, Silicon Valley, what I like to call the Pentagon, the Silicon Valley pipeline, and the uh, the fact that they're saying the quiet power part out loud, even Representative Young Kim said we need to have more joint patrols um, in a Fox News op-ed. We need to have more joint patrols in the South China Sea to uh, make sure we have control over those trade routes. Um, we need to really push back against this. Um, we need to start being more suspect of articles of unnamed sources. Check if the media is not questioning the official U.S. government position. That's always a red flag to me. Um, and we need to start cross-referencing what propagandists are saying with what the actual historical record is. And um, yeah, I, I want to just say that uh, it's really important that we disarm the discourse. Uh, and... I want to um, maybe later share a petition. Uh, we have a petition on Code Pink on our China is our enemy website, where we are demanding an end to disinformation. And there's also a second petition that I'd like to share um, with you. If you go to our latest uh, petition on China is our enemy, we're demanding instead of arming and militarizing uh, countries and regions in Asia, we need to stop wasting money on preparing for war and start spending on 
a climate finance deal. So um, I just like to say we're in a really dangerous time. The United States is fighting multiple wars and hegemony um, and imperialism and violence uh, is threatening the lives of people here in the United States when it comes to anti-Asian hate, when it comes to anti-Arab Islamophobic hate, uh, when it comes to the war in Black America, when it comes to uh, what was happening to, uh, you know, peoples from Latin America, indigenous people who are uh, on, on this country. And we also need to push back on what's happening um, just around the world when it comes to U.S. imperialism more broadly. Thank you, Kale. Thank you so much. And just want to thank Lawson that he was able to join us before he had to run off to school. Um, his insight is so valuable to be there and witnessing um, the way we are used by information. Um, I just want to say right now, uh, Code Pink activists are inside of Congress, um, raising 25 of them, uh, raising their hands with Gaza written on their arms and their fingers are, their hands are all red, um, saying to Blinken and Austin, who are reporting to Congress, asking for another eight to $10 billion for Israel uh, to continue a genocide on the people of Palestine, um, could Pink's um, in Congress saying no, I'm calling for a ceasefire. Um, so, you know, as I said yesterday, uh, now is the time to be engaged. Uh, now is the time to be sharing information you can trust. And also, just as um, Lawson said, this is these are all imperialist violent projects. And, um, you know, when you read information, how does it make you feel? Does it make you feel supported, like you have strong ground and you understand what's happening? Does it make you feel confused? Does it make you turn to hate? Does it make you hate someone? Does it turn someone into an enemy? You know, find out what those trigger points are and how you're being used and don't let yourself be used. And I think also, as Kale was saying, these are racist projects. Um, this is, you know, white supremacy uh, and we're watching it unravel and be its ugliest self right now. And that now there's no denying. Um, at this moment in history, it is which side are you on? the side of the oppressed or the side of the oppressor. It couldn't be clearer. And the thing about this disinformation is that the oppressor controls the narrative. They have, they kind of like own the means of production of the media that you take in and therefore it owns your, your heart and mind. And it is only up to us individually and then collectively as a community, because I wanna say individually it's too hard. It's why in these moments you have to understand that collectivity matters. What community are you part of where you're making each other smarter and wiser and where you together are laying a path to peace? And, you know, because the, <laughs> the, the darkness is so big and dense and uh, it's kind of like a magnet sucking you in, it, it needs community. So um, here we are, uh, as you know, Kel is saying, this is dangerous. And everybody acts like, oh, it's just information. Well, witness this moment. This moment was created by disinformation. Why is the whole world not up in arms watching a genocide? Because some people have been imprisoned by that disinformation and have been so separated from their humanity that they think there can actually be a reason to murder babies. Think about that. That's what this information does. Disinformation weaponizes your hearts and minds to serve the violent imperialist white supremacist empire that I don't think any of us here at Humanity Rising uh, want to be a part of, but it's out there. And, you know, as Kel also, it's like, it is dangerous. And he's showing you these places. It takes these moments of what could tip, what could tip in this moment. And, you know, the, um, the United States likes keeping 
those moments happening all the time. So one can happen that they could use and then just move forward with violence. And um, I think that's what we're seeing right now um, with what's happening in uh, Gaza is where can we take those moments and use them an excuse for utmost violence and that excuse for war. So um, I wonder, um, since we have a little time, if anyone has any questions for this amazing opportunity to have Kale with you, and I wanted to open it up for questions, and I didn't know, Jim, if you had the first one, or um, if we should move to the rest of the audience. Yeah, I'll come in with, with one while we're gathering others. First of all, thank you, Kale. That, that was quite uh, comprehensive. I, in particular, appreciated your chronology uh, because, you know, if you take the overall narrative, you can see clearly an ongoing escalation of tensions and the utilization of the Taiwan issue as a wedge issue uh, to exacerbate uh, conflict, organize the other allies of the United States in the region, and posture China uh, as a warmonger, uh, in the face of which the collective West needs to defend itself with those bases. And I think that the uh, uh, pictogram that you used to show what it would be like if the same situation confronted the United States with literally hundreds of Chinese and Russian and Iranian bases uh, around the United States uh, would give a sense. I mean, uh, the United States would be shocked beyond <laughs> words if something uh, like this uh, happens. And, you know, when a couple uh, students go into Granada, uh, it's considered such an alarming issue that the Re President Reagan sends in an invasion. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so uh, you're really onto something. And I just commend you as a, as a young man uh, for taking on this issue and, and um, informing yourself so uh, deeply and being able to share uh, this information. Um, my daughter-in-law uh, is a Chinese American. And so we've been living out over the last number of years, the increase in anti-Asian violence as the rhetoric against China has been increasing in the mainstream media. And it's really uh, uh, a forceful realization that propaganda, as you said earlier, has an effect. It, it really shapes people's minds and therefore their actions and their words if they believe what they're saying uh, over the mainstream media uh, is in fact true. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I just wanted to, to commend you. And I think that the, the question that I would pose just for your um, comment, what, what's your sense of, of the immediate uh, future? I know that the foreign minister Wang Yi has been in Washington over the last three days. Uh, he's had uh, a meeting with President Biden, Secretary of State Blinken, and apparently had a, a very um, difficult uh, meeting with the National Security Advisor, Jake uh, Sullivan. There's discussion of Xi Jinping um, coming to San Francisco uh, in November. Uh, Wang Yi said there's many uh, challenges yet ahead before that's solidified. But what, what is your sense based on what you know of the current state of Chinese-American uh, relations and sort of what's coming next? Also, Jody, would love to hear from you on this. Uh, yeah, well, thanks so much, Jim. I really appreciate um, you know your feedback and also that question. I, I, I Probably, I mean, right now in the past uh, few months, we've seen uh, just a steady deterioration of China-U.S. relations. Um, there are different areas of, you know, actual diplomacy going on. For example, you know, uh, as you said, you know, Wang Yi's visit, as well as 
um, Gavin Newsom, his visit to uh, China, where he rode an electric car and played basketball. Um, it was like a brief window, I guess, into kind of the way things were in like the 70s and through the 90s. But I think, um, you know, as far as the next few months go, it really depends on if uh, there can be any headway from the Xi Biden summit or the sideline talks. If those do end up happening at APEC in San Francisco um, next month, then I see perhaps we can maybe um, the U.S. might have to take Chinese uh, security assurances seriously um, and, you know, more diplomacy on our end might come from that. Um, I think I, I kind of am a pessimist of the intellect, optimist of the will. So I'm not sure that's going to happen, but I think it's important that the peace movement and the anti-war movement, just as it's been standing up um, with really one voice recently, needs to um, continue that great work um, and pressuring our leaders to reject war and imperialism. Yeah. Yeah, I want to echo what Kale's saying about Newsom um, because it's such a departure. Um, you know, he, I think I read something yesterday that said, oh, the Chinese are going to um, meddle in U.S. elections. And you're just like, both sides want to kill China. <laughs> They're running on it. Like, why what meddling would they do? Um, but um, Newsom really coming back and saying the whole idea, the concept of a Cold War with China or any war with China is too frightening to imagine. It's just the healthiest comment that we've seen in a very long time, yeah, yeah. except of course Kissinger. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's just like, as we're looking at this genocide, we have to notice how inhumane, how violent, at a level that none of us can even fathom, is the U.S. leadership. You know, that they would go to Congress right now and ask for eight to 10 billion more dollars for weapons to murder innocent people. I mean, and when people say it's a, use the word war, which we cannot use that this is a war, this is a genocide. These, you know, Hamas, you know, has no tanks. It has, you know, pickup trucks <laughs> and, you know, barely, you know, has any weapons and, it's this, it, for me, it's kind of looking at Iraq all over again. After going to Iraq, we went to Iraq before shock and awe. And I came back and I told members of Congress, I told Hillary Clinton, I told the New York Times, I told all the media, are you kidding me? You should be ashamed if you're even thinking of dropping a bomb on these people. You have stolen everything from them. They've been living under sanctions. 500,000 children have died. You've been starving them to death. And you're gonna pretend like you have like might taking on the poorest of the poor? That's shameful. Mm. But no, the narr I mean, talk about the narrative. The narrative in the United States was like, you know, we took down this great power of, you know, and they were building weapons of mass destruction. And, you know, that they would prefer to live in the lie. And as we're, you know, watching this, just to think about the fact that four and a half to six million people died in the last 20 years on the war on terror, that we murdered, that we, the United States of America, created the context for, drove, funded, fueled, that so... All right, you could, you know, you've been in denial, you've been in denial, but right now you cannot be in denial. Mm -hmm. And you cannot, you know, not recognize with the contrast of Ukraine how racist it is. You really, really have to recognize that. And it gets voided. But certainly we all saw it at the beginning of the Ukraine war. It was embarrassing and shameful and, and just skin rippingly horrible. But 
when, when you don't act on things, they just get worse. So that's why my bleed is to act. We didn't hold anyone accountable for those four to six million dead. We never held Netanyahu accountable for every international law that he has broken over and over and over again. Where is the accountability and the responsibility? If you just roll over and say, I can't do anything about it, it will escalate until it reaches you. And I, you know, we've, we know that we've seen that. And it really is, it's this moment in time where you get to choose. And I know Kale and Jim are gonna be in the streets on Saturday of Washington, DC. Um, lots and lots of people are coming from all over the world actually to be in the streets um, because we can't agree to this. We can't agree to this level of inhumanity and violence or we will be living in it and you have no idea what that will look like. And we're already living in what it looks like to not have acted around climate change. We're already watching way too many people die in these disasters. What have we lost our commitment to life? If we have, I'm afraid it will be taken away from us. So um, it's really that moment where you choose for life. You choose to be on the side of the oppressed against the oppressor. Um, we have so many great teachers that um, showed us the way, had the courage. We honor their lives with holidays and you know books and movies, but we do that to remember, to be them when that moment arises. So um, yet again, this week is about the disinformation helping you come out of it. And I saw Stan asking about um, where do you find your news? And so it starts first with you. It starts with those questions I asked earlier. How does this make you feel? Does this make you feel wiser? Do you feel like you have more intelligence or is it somehow undermined you, made you feel um, less sure, more confused, more angry and hateful? Check, so there's the moments where you check it out. Like, why do I feel this way? Um, it's kind of like listening to Jim yesterday reading um, Chris. It made you feel like there was a ground under your feet. It resonated truth. Where do you feel that resonation of truth that even though it's difficult to listen to, which was hard, you know, to listen to some of those sentences. But, um, you know, sometimes uh, you got to remember the truth will set us free, but first it will piss you off. Like those moments where you feel agitated by the truth because it somehow disrupts some stability you've been standing on that might not be so strong, that might be a pack of lies. And then find those voices out there that have been shut out of the media. You're going to have to go to the corners, but why are they in the corners? Because they have been shut out. When somebody's been shut out, I'd check them out. Um, you don't have to always believe them, but uh, if they've, you know, if they've got a following and people that you respect are listening to them, check out and see what that does for you. How, how does that make you feel? Be part of a community where you're debating these ideas where you're having a conversation um, because we've lost that capacity to have conversations and really explore these ideas with each other. I mean, right now we are living in a lot of confusion. I'm sure there are so many layers to what is happening right now, geopolitical, regional, you know, like there's layers and layers and layers of history, of greed, of need, of hate. Um, don't get locked in any of them. Try to be in the layers of them and understand the complexity that you don't have control over, but you do have the control over how you respond. That is what you have control over. Don't let the information use you. Don't let it turn you into a monster. Um, because right now to be in agreement with a genocide means that you've agreed to be a monster.
you've let go of your humanity. And it doesn't mean that you have the right to get angry at anyone because of that. I mean, if anything, I would open up my heart to how lost they are and then be available with some information that might serve them. And if it doesn't, it's not, has nothing to do with you and everything to do with them. So here we are. Peace is who we are. Humanity is what we are striving to serve. Here's your chance to be engaged like never before, I don't know, in my lifetime. Um, so uh, tomorrow, um, maybe Jim, you could key us up for what to expect tomorrow. Yes, uh, first, uh, just a quick comment on on your remarks, uh, Jody, which I think are so important. Uh, and to Stan's question about sources, there are sources out there, but you have to look for them. And I suggest Chris Hedges, uh, who is one of the most respected journalists of our time. I suggest Seymour Hirsch, another extraordinarily uh, respected, decorated. They've won Pulitzer Prizes. I suggest um, uh, Jeremy uh, Sachs, the economist at Columbia University. Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs, excuse me, at, at Columbia University, John Mersheimer, uh, University of Chicago. If you want a, a, a great analysis of the delusions of U.S. foreign policy, John Mersheimer, who's probably the, the most respected scholar in international relations. So the, 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 the truth is out there. It's just it's not going to be available to you on CNN or MSNBC or Fox News. So you have to take responsibility to look for it elsewhere. But once you start to track, for example, there's a, a, a Greek uh, guy named Alexander Mercurius, who is the best single daily commentator on what's happening in the world that I personally know about. I, I basically get my news from the people that I've just named, uh, but I would add Alexander Mercurius um, you know, go to the Code Pink website. Uh, there's all kinds of good stuff on Code Pink. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's lots out there, but you've got to sort of get off, up off the couch and turn some channels on your, your TV uh, and, uh, and, and search. Um, and then the other thing I would say, just so we're taking in what Jody's saying about genocide. I read something today that I found shocking that in the last seven days or so, in the last week on Gaza, the Israelis have dropped over 6,000 bombs. That's the equivalent of what the United States dropped in an entire year in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan is is uh, uh, 180,000 times bigger than Gaza. So if you think that thought, that in the last seven days, 200,000 buildings have been damaged or destroyed, over 200 schools have been damaged over, uh, or destroyed, nearly 40 mosques and religious facilities have been damaged or destroyed, one third of all the hospitals and health facilities in Gaza have been completely uh, destroyed. And what emerged in the news today is a, is a concept paper from the Israeli military um, uh, calling for the complete elimination of all 2.3 million people from Gaza into Egypt. So we're, we're talking about uh, a, a mounting pressure that we need to be not only informed about, but as uh, 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 Jody and Kale are talking about, we need to be willing to get out on the streets. And, uh, and, and people are coming out on the streets by the hundreds of thousands, over 100,000 recently in London, all over the Middle East, in India, um, uh, and, and even in the United States. You're not going to find it on the mainstream news, but it's out there. And I would just, again, one of the reasons why we 
partner with Code Pink is because they're out there and go to the Code Pink website. They list where you can go, not just in Washington. There's going to be a big march in San Francisco, Los Angeles. Uh, so just go to, you know, codepink.org. But this is one of those moments, everyone, where you need to you need to be either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. Eldridge Cleaver was right. And uh, so I'm going to be on the streets in Washington, D.C. with Kale uh, and hopefully tens of thousands of, of others uh, just in Washington this Saturday. Um, uh, but it's important that we all take in the magnitude of what is happening in Gaza right now, because this is genocide and ethnic cleansing at almost an unprecedented level uh, in our lifetime. Tomorrow, um, we are going to uh, turn our attention from whistleblowers uh, around the Chinese issue to uh, the issue of uh, unidentified flying objects and what is now called unidentified anomalous phenomena. And we're gonna be hearing from Danny Sheehan, uh, who has been the general counsel and legal counsel for the great whistleblowers on the UFO issue. He was also the general counsel for Daniel Ellsberg in the New York Times and probably a half a dozen other whistleblowers so when you talk to Danny Sheehan, he is the guy <laughs> who, when the whistleblowers are hauled up into court, they call Danny. And he is one, uh, is my recollection, he's won every case. Because he knows how to streak, uh, speak truth to power, having been educated at the Harvard College and Harvard Law School, uh, and is one of the most brilliant, intelligent, legal minds of our time. And uh, so uh, tomorrow is an opportunity uh, to uh, listen to Danny Sheehan on the, really the courage of the whistleblower and uh, his experience uh, in defending whistleblowers over the last 50 years. So that's tomorrow here on Humanity Rising. So Kale, uh, thank you and thank Lawson and Jody as ever. Uh, thank you so much. And that'll bring us to a close. You're all welcome to the after session chat. You'll see the link in the chat box. You received it in your Zoom uh, uh, reminder. And then we'll see you all tomorrow uh, here on Humanity Rising. Thank you, everyone. Bye thank for you, now. everyone. Thank you, Kale. Thank you.